I'll take this to the highest court in the country. I should have picked a lower court. I'm bushed. Believe it or not, that segment is older than I am. I remember watching that when I was a kid between Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam fussing over that house that you can see Bugs running from. And so, like anybody, he wants to have his day in court. And he picked the highest court. Well, as Christians, we are answerable to the highest court in the land. In fact, it's the highest court in the universe, in, in creation. That's the court of God. And sometimes we run into conflicts with biblical teaching and man's law. So what do we do? Well, as we're going to see today in Acts chapter 5, we should do like Peter and the apostles did, and appeal to the highest court, that is, to God, and obey God rather than men, which is going to be kind of a continuation of last week's lesson, where in Acts chapter 4, Peter kind of left it up to them and said, look, if it's better for us to obey God than you, you decide. You make the call. But in Acts chapter 5, the tone of both Peter and the Sanhedrin is different. Both of them are, are ratcheted up a, a quite a bit. So get your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 5, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell when it comes up so you'll be notified anytime content's added to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos, you know the drill. Acts chapter 5, all set. And remember, if you're not careful, you might just learn something before we're done. So let's get started. You won't be quite as exhausted going to this high court as Bugs was going to his. True reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 26 through 32. I'll start with verse 25. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with the officers and brought the apostles. He did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed and hanged on the tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness to all Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Okay, glad to see everyone here. If you'll keep your Bibles there at Acts, we're going to be looking at this. Uh, passage some more. And, you know, in America, we do have regular conflict between government entities, particularly state and federal laws. Uh, probably the best example I can think of is how some states have legalized, to some degree, uh, recreational drugs, particularly marijuana. In some states, uh, it is legal to have it in small amounts and use it for medicinal purposes, and sometimes for recreational. Some states have uh, not legalize it, but decriminalize it. There's a difference. Decriminalize just means it's still illegal, but instead of being a criminal offense, it's more of a civil offense, like a traffic ticket or something like that, where pay a fine, do some community service, that kind of thing, and you avoid a, a jail record. And then there's also this conflict. 
We get conflict between God's law and man's law sometimes. Now, this could be the legislation, or it could be a company policy, uh, particularly during the month of June when so many businesses and corporations tend to want to jump on the pride bandwagon and celebrate sin for 30 days. Uh, and it has become a problem for some people who are professing Christians where companies want them to wear the pride buttons and do all this sort of thing, where kids are uh, taken to school. There, I think it was up in Canada where the kids are getting off the bus and there's the school staff uh, telling them Happy Pride Day as they came into the school. And then you might have heard about the one in Massachusetts where the kids uh, were encouraged to dress with the rainbow and all this. And there was a segment of the student body who said, nah. And they showed up with red, white, and blue and, and that kind of thing and said, my pronouns are USA and this sort of thing. And that drew the ire of not only the administration, but the school board. Sometimes we are going to have man's law, which wants us to do things uh, that con uh, is contrary to God's law. We've probably heard about the situation out in Colorado with Jack Phillips. And then there was a web designer who designed websites for weddings and they both have been in hot water. The Jack Phillips situation has been going on for over a decade where he won't make cakes for a same-sex couple. He won't do cakes for transgender announcement parties and that kind of thing because it violates his religious beliefs. His business is off by about 40% because for a long time there he couldn't make cakes. They, they would not allow him, the state of Colorado wouldn't allow him uh, to make cakes. So what do we do in those situations? Do we just adopt the you can't fight city hall attitude and do nothing? Or do we take the route that Peter and the apostles took? A very bold, very courageous route, where they said, uh, well, back in chapter 4, they were kind of nice about it, but you can see chapter 5, uh, it's getting a little bit testy now. For, uh, chapter 4, they were respectful in chapter 4. They kind of left it up to the Sanhedrin. You know, uh, it's whether it's right for us to obey God or men, you decide. But now in chapter 5, where they're seeing more miracles, uh, in fact, there's a point there where they're laying the people with, who are sick and who are demon-possessed out, hoping Peter's shadow would, over, would, would, would cross over them, so that might cure them. Uh, the early disciples are, are, are out there, and they're still in Jerusalem. They're out there. They are performing miracles. They're doing great things. The Sanhedrin can't deny it, and so they're getting uh, a little bit annoyed with this whole thing. All these healings, you would think, now logically, wouldn't you think everybody would be happy? celebrating, hey, these sick people are well. The guy over here that, that had a demon for all those years, that's gone. Logically, you would think everybody should be celebrating. That would be the logical thing to do, but it's not the correct uh, conclusion. Because not everybody was happy. Here in uh, chapter 4, just back up, we looked at this last week. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. You make the call. You decide if it's right. For we cannot but speak the things which, watch this, we have seen and heard. You know, guys, we've seen quite a bit. We've seen people healed. We've seen demons cast out. We have heard uh, the testimony from people who've uh, been cured. And so when they further threaten them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, uh, because of the people, since they glorified God. Well, they've got popular support right now. So we can't do it. It's a typical politician thing. Uh, they've got popular support, and I want to keep myself uh, in office. I, you know, uh, yeah, I guess we just better let them go. Because the man was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. Go back to Acts chapter 3, the guy lying there at the gate uh, at the temple called Beautiful. And that's the one that Peter, passing by, said, hey, look at me. He's, you know, the guy was asking for alms, for, for handouts, because uh, he, he was uh, crippled. So Peter says, look at me, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he got up, and how are you going to deny that? Because they knew this guy had been paralyzed for a long time, and uh, he's 40 years old now, so how are you going to deny that? And then look there, verse 19, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than men, you decide. Are we at a point where we might have to say something like that? Could be getting there. There's a lot of countries where uh, Christianity is not legal, or maybe uh, a certain brand is, or you got Islam or Buddhism or whatever uh, ism that is the religion, and no, Christianity can't uh, uh, exist there, not legally anyway. 
But notice the boldness here. They, they, they knew that these guys had been with Jesus. They, they knew that they were his disciples. And now we're coming into Acts chapter 5. The high priest in the, uh, has got the apostles again in front of them, in front of the Sanhedrin. And now it, it's really starting to get testy. It's getting heated. We told you not to preach anymore in this guy's name. Verse 17 says they were filled with indignation. That's a word that could also be translated as jealousy. They were jealous of Jesus. They were jealous of the apostles. They told the apostles, refrain, quit preaching. We don't want to hear it. But then look at verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The NIV and the New American say, that we must obey God rather than men. Now, see, they're not playing they're no more Mr. Nice Guy. They're not saying, okay, look, whether this is right for us to obey God or you decide, you make the call. No, we're making the call. We must obey God rather than men. And so I want us to look at this higher authority that we answer to. We, we have to understand that ultimately we answer to God. Not the, not the earthly government here. And this took a lot of courage for them to do that. We've got, kind of been tying this together with the idea of courage. And as Christians, standing firm for our beliefs. And here you can see them definitely standing firm before the Sanhedrin. The idea here of our higher authority, to obey God and not men. And sometimes it will be difficult. It will be costly. Remember, they, here in this context, they've been in prison. And I've known some people in other countries who've faced jail time for their uh, standing for, for the Lord and standing for truth. Now, in America, they've, I think we're, we're getting kind of to that point where people are starting to get pressure on them to conform. Churches, you can see now in, in the media, are uh, changing their Bible beliefs, a lot of them. And why are they doing that? Well, because we need to be more inclusive. We need to be more accepting. No, that's the wrong answer. That's the wrong approach. We're going to face uh, uh, pressures to conform. But remember, when a person becomes a Christian, it's up to me, now that I'm a Christian, to conform to what God's Word says. Now, if that means i got to change something in my life, well, that's just the way it goes. And you think about how many other things in our lives require change. This is no different. Verse 29, look there and notice the, they're ordered to stop uh, preaching. And you know, okay, yeah, I guess you're right. We should, we should just quit. And you notice they didn't say, well, you know what? This is what our church told us. This is what the preacher said. Or, no, what they say? They appealed to God. Whether it's right, for, or rather in uh, uh, chapter 5, we must, we ought, we will obey God, not you. They're appealing to a higher authority. And in some places of the world, Christians have to do that. They are persecuted at times for their faith. Now, what motivated them to have this conviction? Well, first of all, there's the sovereignty of God. God is the creator of the universe. God is the one that gives us the authority uh, to speak. Jesus said, all authorities in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Now you go, and as you go, uh, make disciples of all nations. The disciples recognize that God was carrying out a divine plan here. That they are part of that plan. They're the instruments to carry out the plan. Tell people about that death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Jesus that was uh, provided for our salvation. And they are convinced that salvation is found in Jesus only. Do we really believe that today? That salvation is only in Jesus. If we do, we need to be talking more about it. All of us, everybody needs to be talking more about it to our neighbors and our friends. What about thankfulness? I think they're thankful too of the salvation that they've got. That is going to make them want to speak out. I believe that's the best way we can thank God for our salvation is to tell somebody else about it. The best way to, to let God know we appreciate it, we're not taking it for granted, is to tell somebody. Yeah, it's important to be here on Sundays and to gather uh, here on Sundays and Wednesdays, but the, the biggest, greatest thing we can do to show appreciation to the Lord is to tell people about Jesus because of the rescuing that we have from our bondage of sin. And the apostles, I think, really understood what that meant. They had been with Jesus. They saw what Jesus went through. I think they understood what that meant. And so now they want to tell everybody, Sanhedrin, uh, nah, we're not going to be quiet. We are going to tell everybody that we can what, uh, what Jesus has done for us. God is the highest authority. Our first obedience goes to him. They wanted to obey God. They knew that one day is coming a judgment. 
one day we're all going to stand before the throne like this, uh, this uh, artist depiction is where the books are going to be open, then what are we going to say if, if the Lord uh, uh, is not happy with the way that we didn't proclaim the gospel to people? Look at their intent. Verse 29, you can see exactly what they intend to do. You send us out of here, we're going to keep preaching. Send us back to jail, we're going to preach there. Wherever we go, we're going to preach. They had, if you go back to verse 19, that's where the angel sprung them out of jail and gave them their mandate to go out and preach, and uh, they would have been sinning if they didn't go out and do what they were told to do. Let's go on out and proclaim it. Okay, let's go. Look, look at verse uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. We understand that as Christians, God wants us to do everything we can to live peaceably with those around us. Okay, but conflict is going to be inevitable. In any relationship, there's going to be conflict at one time or another. The conflict may be something serious, could be, you know, something minor, you never know. And we should do everything as possible in our power to be at peace with all men. But occasionally, what do you mean you're a Christian? Why are you a Christian? We're going to have to uh, give them an answer. And someone may not like our answer. Our co-workers and even our family may take issue with the fact that we're, we're a Christian. What are you believing that all, all of that uh, outdated stuff for? That's so old-fashioned, who would want to live like that? Uh, that tells me there they really haven't taken a close look at it. So we do what we can to keep the peace. But situations will come sometimes, and that's where we have to obey God and trust. Like somebody once said, we obey God, we leave the consequences to Him. That's up to Him to take care of it. He may do, uh, execute some kind of judgment on the persecutor. On the other hand, there was this guy named Saul of Tarsus. You might have heard of him. What happened with him? God got through to him. No Christian would have gone and tried to convert Saul. He was busy throwing him into jail. You think for a minute any of his fellow Pharisees would have tried to convert him to Christianity? Hmm. Don't think so. What's the only other option? I think uh, he had a little encounter on this road to Damascus where he was going, where Jesus... Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, 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 or, uh, uh, Hamada, Hamada, Hamada. He didn't know, you know, who are you, Lord? What do you want? What must I do now? All right, going into town. You know, the, you know the rest of it. But he was converted with that encounter with Jesus, one of the worst persecutors of Christianity. And he became a Christian and became its biggest champion. So looking back at Acts chapter 5, they've gotten what we would today call a cease and desist order. You stop. Do not uh, preach uh, any uh, uh, about Jesus. You go on back out there, you don't say anything about them. They are jealous. They are indignant. That word can mean jealousy of the apostles, and they were jealous of Jesus. Remember, Pilate knew that they, that they had turned Jesus over to him because of envy. He knew that. And it's the same thing now. They don't want to have to deal with all this again. They're getting the attention. They're threatening our power base. They're threatening everything about our livelihood. The Sanhedrin, I've wondered if the apostles had just kept it all quiet on the down low, you know, just met in homes and just, you know, kind of a social club, would they, they have been bothered as much or persecuted as much? And I think the answer to that is no. If they had just been quiet about it, Sanhedrin probably would have been happy, but they're not being quiet. They're out there on the street corners uh, uh, preaching. They are not being silent. They keep teaching and preaching in Jesus' name. And where were they here? They're in the temple. Now, just think about it. Suppose we left here now and we went on down to, uh, to some denominational church, the Catholic church, let's just say, or the Methodist. Pick your church. And we just walked in there and started preaching, uh, preaching Jesus. You think we'd be well received? Hmm. I don't think so. Just like they weren't well received here. Or if we went to a mosque or to a synagogue. I don't know if we have any synagogues around here, but if we didn't started preaching Jesus, I think the unwelcome sign would probably go up very quick. It went up here very quickly. They didn't want them preaching there in the temple. This is where we work. This is where we make, make uh, our livelihood. This is off limits. This is a, well, they didn't have the expression then, but if they did, they, this is a no-fly zone. You don't, you don't come in here preaching that. And look at their complaint. First of all, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Have we filled Danville with our teaching, or rather with, with biblical teaching? 
You know, it was true. They were filling the city. They were out there wherever they could find an audience. They, they, there's somebody gathered over there uh, getting water out of a well. All right, let's go over and preach to them. You know, somebody over here uh, looks like they're in the market. They're doing some, but let's go over and talk to them. Wherever they could find an audience, they were going to proclaim it. And then look at the sec verse 18. Look at the second chart. They are bringing this man's blood upon them. One um, uh, commentator I was preparing for this lesson uh, happened to point out the fact they can't even bring themselves to say Jesus' name. This man, you are bringing this man's blood upon us. Which is also sort of ironic because Matthew records when, when uh, Pilate gave him the choice. You got Barabbas here or Jesus, which one do you want me to release to you? They said, well, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And then what did they say after that? His blood be upon us and on our children. So why are they, what, what are they complaining about here? You said basically said, put, the, put his blood on us. It's on us that we did this. And now you're complaining about it. Somebody needs to make up their mind. They, are, they uh, see what is happening here, and they, they have their minds made up. They don't care about the facts. This shows you how belief can be such a powerful thing, even though you can be shown facts to the contrary. Uh, no, I, you know, I've made up my mind. Nope, don't want to see it. Don't want to be challenged to think. Don't want my beliefs or my ideas challenged. No, we're not going to do it. And keep in mind, too, the high priest most likely was a Sadducee, and at least half of the uh, Sanhedrin is a Sadducee. Now, when, later on, when after Paul's conversion, and he starts talking about the resurrection, you know, that became a big deal. They didn't believe in it. So they, they've got some kind of liberal, what would then be considered liberal ideas there. Uh, about Jesus and about this new doctrine that they're that they're uh, hearing about, Peter challenged them uh, and their authority, emphasizing some truths that you know that God raised Jesus from the dead, resurrected him. A resurrection? What are you talking? We don't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe that. Plus, they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. So you know, there's a lot a lot tying into this. God exalted him. He's Prince. He's Savior. God has exalted him to a high position. Paul would later tell the Philippians. Remember that God has exalted him and given a name that is above every other name. And then uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is at God's right hand. And also they were witnesses. It's fascinating to look at how many times the apostles and people in Acts and others claim to be witnesses of, of the events that happened. And yet people today discard them. Try to make the New Testament... Uh, to be something that was just made up and legend and this and that. But where do you, where do you get all the witnesses if, if it's a legend or if it's something that was made up? I don't know of any, any uh, legend that has eyewitnesses. I've heard of a lot of legends from history. Robin Hood I, is, is considered a legend. I don't know anyone who's claimed to be an eyewitness to that. But to Jesus, we got people who said they were eyewitnesses. They saw it. In fact, we were just in uh, Second Peter. The Apostle Peter says, we, talks about the transfiguration in Matthew 17. says, we were witnesses. I was there when it happened. So why do we discard that eyewitness testimony? Now let's look at making God the authority. We're appealing to a higher authority. How, how first of all, you've got to get into the Word. You've got to know the authority. You've got to get into it. Spend some time reading. No, you don't need a whole library and spend hours and hours, but spend some time at least reading. Asking questions, making notes. Because how can you tell someone, thus saith the Lord, if you don't know what saith the Lord? How are you going to tell someone how to become a Christian if, if you, you don't know how to do it yourself? Oh yeah, I became a Christian, but see, now how did that work again? Uh, you know, you, you got to keep that in mind. And, and understand what he expects of us in our daily lives. The psalmist tells us that God's word is a lamp. You know, that tells us how to walk and where to walk. And remember, a lamp, remember, okay, so you know, we all just went through a little bit of time here where we didn't have power for a while. But those flashlights didn't work unless you went and got them out of the drawer and turned them on, right? What would have happened if you just left it in the drawer and the house is getting dark? Where's the light? Oh, I got to go over to the drawer, find it, put the batteries in it, turn it on. God's Word works exactly that way doesn't do any good if you just leave it sitting on the coffee table or sitting in the car or if you just leave it in your pocket on your phone or on your computer. You got to take it out, 
right? Get into your, your uh, device and, and open up the app or take it out off the shelf. Open it up. Use it. Immerse yourself in it. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, the old King James translates this as study to show thyself approved, a workman unto God. Uh, it, it's probably better translated be a workman uh, or, or study to show yourself a workman approved of God, a diligent workman, be skillful in understanding God's word. And so to do it, that means that you don't change it, you don't distort it, and you make sure you have the right purpose. I mean, the word of God has been used for some pretty bad things by people who had pretty bad motives. You can't change it, you can't distort it, just like if you are teaching literature. If you're teaching about Shakespeare, you're teaching about Faulkner, or pick a writer, and you're teaching uh, what their writings are, you can't change their, what they wrote, distort it or anything. You need to present it to the class uh, and discuss it and, and not make any changes, present it as the author wrote it and not give any other purpose to it except to present it. Now, with God's Word, we, it, it demands change. The Word of God demands that we ch make changes in our lives. That's, that's all there is to it. We change, it doesn't change. We have to understand. The final, uh, in fact, when you get down here to the end of uh, first, uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, and he tells him that uh, he should be unashamed, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. That refers to the shame that someone uh, may feel if they are shown to be incompetent or shoddy workmanship. Uh, have you ever done a job, maybe, maybe like, okay, you mowed the lawn when you were a kid and dad came out and said, come here, and you, know, you, you, you missed the spot over here. Uh, there's a spot over here you got too low. Uh, the weed whacker, you didn't uh, get around that tree over there. And he points out all the places that you didn't get the job done. That's, you know, the shoddy workmanship. And, and what, how, how did we feel then? Uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Or a customer on the job comes back and shows you there was something wrong with the job that you did, the, the, you know, painting the house or whatever it is that you did. And that shows that there's some shoddy workmanship or maybe you just can't get the job done. Okay, he doesn't want you to be ashamed. He wants you to, what Paul is saying, is do a good job, do a competent job, and skillfully handle uh, the Word of God. Another way is prayer. Uh, our corporate prayers like we do here when we're assembled together or individual prayer. I might have told you once about a, a, a class that a friend of mine was in. It was married couples. I uh, wasn't married at the time. And they added up the amount of time, I believe it was 20 people, 10 couples, something like that, and it, throughout the week, the average amount of time that that class, everybody averaged together, spent in prayer, would you believe was less than five minutes? And that's not counting the prayers they had for their meals. It's not a lot of prayer, is it? But Muslims pray five times a day. How many of us Christians actually pray once a day? Hey, yeah, well, I pray on Sunday and church. Okay, that's fine. That's good. What about tomorrow? Do you have, are you going to pray tomorrow? Or pray maybe later today or Tuesday or Wednesday. That's one way we get we get closer to God. We get closer to God through Jesus and our and our prayers. And these continue. Look at Acts one verse fourteen. These continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Okay, they continued. They didn't just stop. We prayed once. Okay, and they went on. See, when they were fearful, they prayed. They had a lot to be fearful. Then they didn't have the freedoms that we have. When they were confused, they prayed. They're waiting on God. You know, when, when they, in fact, back in Acts chapter 1, remember they prayed for the successor to Judas. We're going to cast lots. We're going to pray about it. We got these two men here. And then and the lot fell to Matthias. And then uh, they were pray, uh, that, uh, when they were confused, when they were in prison, when they had questions, they prayed. And what about today? Do Christians today really use prayer like they did then in the first century? And then the verb translated continued mean they were busy, they were persistent. They didn't just do it once and quit. They did it all the time. Now, I don't think it means they, you know, they were walking around with their heads bowed and you know, bouncing into walls and that kind of thing, but they had a prayerful attitude. If they got a problem, we got a problem, we can't figure out this passage of Scripture, let, let's pray about it. Trying to decide what to, to do about a situation? Come on, people, let's just get together here and let's just pray about it. Christians today, do we, do we have that same prayerful attitude they had? Jesus, remember, endorsed private individual prayer. You know, if you have to, find a secluded private place. 
Maybe if you have a shop out back, uh, you know, where you have your tools, guys, that could be your private place. If, uh, if the ladies, you got a sewing room or a craft room or something, that could be your place. Uh, if you got a spare bedroom uh, in the house, a friend once who uh, had a three bedroom house, he was a bachelor. He had one dedicated bedroom, his own. The other bedroom became his prayer closet, essentially. And you could you know, do whatever work. You got to find whatever's going to work for you. Maybe go out and sit in the car for whatever. A secluded place where you can pray. Just, just you and the Lord. Go there, shut the door so you can concentrate uh, on your prayers. We worked uh, one of the group homes we worked in. Sometimes the staff in the office would go on what we called protected time. That meant they don't take any phone calls, no visitors, no nothing, usually because they had the various paperwork to do. But that was protected time. Unless it was a dire emergency, somebody was, you know, you were calling the ambulance for somebody, they didn't, they, they didn't take any visitors. And that should be our prayer time. This is my prayer time. It's my protected time. And I'm going to get with the Lord. And then I'll see you in 30 minutes or whatever your, your, uh, your time is. Unless someone has really got a, a, a dire emergency. That something is really uh, going on that they need you. But if someone just wants to stop by and chit-chat, no, sorry, I'm, uh, it's, it's, this is my quiet time. This is my prayer time. Corey Ten Boom, you may have heard of her. She and her family went to concentration camps for helping the Jews during the Second World War, and she was the only one that survived the war. Uh, later found out she was released uh, from uh, her camp uh, by a mistake. Uh, and then she went around the world uh, until she passed away. Notice she died on her 91st birthday. Uh, she uh, went around the world talking about her experiences and the forgiveness uh, that she, you know, had a lot to say about that. But she said, when a Christian shuns fellowship with other Christians, the devil smiles. When he stops studying the Bible, the devil laughs. When he stops praying, the devil shouts for joy. So are we giving the devil reason for joy or for laughs or for smiling? Oh, the, you know, don't quit the fellowship. Keep the fellowship. You know, we got our groups today, but and our Wednesday classes, you know, be back for them. If you can't make it for them, maybe try and get together with Christians another time. And, and don't stop studying and don't stop praying. To look at Peter and the other apostles, how they're able to stand up against the religious establishment. And, and uh, later on, you know, Paul ended up in Rome, and there were Christians uh, who had to deal with persecution from the Roman government. But you notice Peter did it by knowing God's word and by being deep in prayer. He was, you know, the ch early church prayed together, they prayed individually. We can continue doing that too. We need to stand just like he did. We need to be standing and tell people, look, I'm going to obey God. You know, make it like uh, Joshua told the people there, choose this day whom you're going to serve. We've all got to make that decision. Everybody's got to decide what they're going to do with Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus today? If, uh, if uh, we, we go out and Jesus is out there in the yard and he says, well, time's over. I'm taking my people home. Are you ready to go? Now, if you're not, then let's talk about it. And if there's anything we can do to help you be prepared, to be immersed, to have your sins forgiven, to study with you, pray, whatever you, you might need to make sure you're ready, if we can help you, let us know as together we stand and as we sing.